Well, hello, everyone. I'm Robert Walonsky, Communications Director here at Heritage Auctions. And, uh, well, we're here to talk about Texas art, as evidenced by the fact that I'm joined by Adley Phillips, the Director of Texas Art here at Heritage Auctions. Adley, I wore this just for you. Is that all right? Oh, I love it. I love a Texas hat. Well, I figured it was for Texas art, but I'll probably take it off. It was my dad's hat and a recent gift, so I thought it would be a shame not to show it off here for just a minute. Of course. It's better looking than my Stetson, though. It covers <laughs> most of my face, that's why. So, Adley, this is a great thrill. We and I, You and I have not had a chance to talk about Texas art during the year and I, a half I've been here at Heritage, but I'm excited to do so. You and I are both Texas natives. I was born in the great city of Dallas, where I'm currently sitting. You uh, had the uh, great fortune to be born in Fort Worth. See, I yeah. don't have that uh, Dallas-Fort Worth rivalry. We, we live in a, a big, beautiful region, don't we? We do. There is, you know, Texas art is a really big category, and it's as diverse as the state itself. It really is. There's so much going on everywhere. Well, I'm very excited to have the opportunity here for the next hour or so to talk about the state of the Texas art market. If you have a question for us, uh, by which I mean if you have a question for Adley, Feel free to ask it here during the uh, stream yard here, or if you want to do so anonymously, ask it at Tommy A, Tommy N, excuse me, Tommy N at HA.com is where you will email that. And Tommy, who's directing behind the scenes and making sure that we see the right images, we sound and look good, will uh, send those questions to us. And if you have a question for Adley uh, after this, Adley, it's just Adley P at HA.com, correct? That's correct. So we're obviously been doing these state of the market conversations kind of in between auctions, because what's interesting is the fact that uh, markets across the board are doing incredibly well in the last mm -hmm. year and a half. We're certainly going to discuss why that is. But also you uh, have an auction upcoming in, August, in October, and mm -hmm. it is not too late to bring consignments in for that, correct? Absolutely not. Um, the auction is October 23rd on a Saturday, as usual. Uh, but we can still accept consignments up to the published deadline is August 20th, but we can even fudge that a little bit longer if we know something's coming in. So we have a couple of weeks to get in property. So if anyone has um, any consignments or just questions about something in their collection, there's still plenty of time to give me a call or shoot me an email and see if it might be a good fit for our upcoming sale. So look, let's, I have so many questions for you. One of which is you you grew up in a family of, of art gallery owners, correct? In mm -hmm. Dallas and Fort Worth. So so this is something you have been around your entire life. Certainly those of us born and raised in Texas have been around yeah. Texas art our entire lives. But this is something in which you have had a, a real interest in and love for for most of your life. Yeah, no, I'm I'm so lucky. I grew up in Fort Worth and my grandparents have been friends with a number of the member, members of the Fort Worth Circle, which is a group of modernists, a lot like the Dallas Nine, um, who worked in the 30s and 40s and were very well known. And um, my father became an art dealer, um, along with my mom, um, opened the Fort Worth Gallery and then Dutch Phillips and Company. And they represented a lot of those artists in the 70s and 80s. And my father helped really start this craze where, um, along with some other dealers and scholars around, where they were looking at the art from the mid-century and this was in the 80s and 90s. And if you see behind me, I have a brother who was a member of the Fort Worth Circle and was my favorite artist growing up. And um, my father represented him at the gallery. I got to know him a little bit when I was younger. And so that was one reason why, even though I had never formally studied um, Texas art, um, I did have a background and I had enough art history training to teach myself. And so I got to Heritage and started um, you know, uh, wanting to promote and offer those artists. So one of the first pieces I sold at Heritage was called The Visitors, which is a broader. And um, it immediately set a world record for him. There are very rarely oil paintings by him that come to um, auction. And this is one. And this is an early work um, before he got really abstract, like the one you just saw behind me. And um, it was exciting. It was thrilling. We sold it for 35000 which is a lot for a mid-century regional artist. And um, you know, I got to feel close to my dad and my family and, um, you know, do what I love. So that was sort of how I dove into my time at Heritage and then, you know, quickly started to educate myself about the breadth of Texas history and Texas art in the state, which is really quite considerable. Well, it's interesting because you mentioned the Dallas Nine. That's really how I began my love affair with Texas art. Jerry Bywater is the founder of the Dallas Museum of Art and, and, mm -hmm. and 
uh, the folks who were at the uh, at Fair Park, uh, certainly defining the Dallas art scene in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, mm -hmm. That's really kind of where my knowledge came in, and the Dallas regionalism. Uh, yeah, that's certainly a big part. I, of I like to kind of jokingly call them the Dallas Nine through Thirteen because <laughs> there's some, you know, there's some artists that fit in, or they're sort of Dallas Nine adjacent. But they were, um, I consider them to be a little bit more regionalist in style than some of the Fort Worth Circle. A lot of the Fort Worth right. Circle were a little bit more modernist. I think they looked to Europe um, and Mexico a little bit more than to what was going on with Thomas Hart Benton and some of the other artists in America at the time. But um, you know, those works are so beloved. And those were the first works to really get snapped up in the craze, like I was talking about. So it's so rare that a Jerry Bywaters comes up for auction. It just almost never happens. They're already in collections. They're already in museums. Um, so for instance, I'm working on right now, and I think we're going to get it in, a small watercolor by Jerry Bywaters from, really? from a depression era. I don't have a picture of it yet for you. I hope it's coming in. We finishing the paperwork right now. But, um, you know, even that is exciting because it's just not that much of it out there. And this happens with the Fort Worth Circle as well. People inherit it and they don't want to sell it. They, that, those are the pieces they want to keep. So, um, you know, if you do have a work by the Dallas Nine or the Fort Worth Circle, it's definitely going to be in very high demand. Well, so that, that's a really interesting question. And obviously throughout the course of this, I'm going to ask you a lot of dumb guy questions. because this Oh, is I a, love it. Yeah, there's no field. dumb questions. <laughs> well, it's a field in which I have great interest, but not great knowledge simply for the fact that it's 30 years as a journalist, you learn a lot about a lot. You yeah. learn a little about a lot and hope it's enough. <laughs> so, you know, writing about the Dallas Nine over the course of 30 years on and off, I got fascinated by the fact that every now and then pieces of theirs would show up mm -hmm. and they would be unheralded or underappreciated. And I kind of wonder... Are there some Texas artists who you believe are at the moment really unappreciated and whose works you think should, in fact, uh, be more coveted than they are now and probably will be in the future? Yeah, well, um, let's see. I mean, one that comes to mind a lot when you think of sort of artists that are underappreciated in Texas is an artist called Ben Colwell. And I don't have any prepared images of him, but I would you know, encourage everyone to look him up. There are examples on our website we've sold in the past. And um, he was an abstract expressionist who um, was actually, and this is something I had no idea of. I, I taught myself the first time I got one of his pieces in the auction, but he was actually part of the 14 American show, the seminal show with Jackson Pollock and Noguchi right. and all of those. And in the New York Times review of that show, the term abstract expressionism was actually coined when talking about his art and his surfaces and the way he manipulated paint. Oh, thank you, Tommy, for finding that. Um, and he's good. He didn't sell anything. And so he came home and he kind of worked in semi obscurity for many, many years. Um, and it's only really been in the last decade or so that there have been a couple of um, shows at galleries of some of his work, um, you know, from his estate and a few things pop up. But I mean, he's so amazing. I mean, he's the lost abstract expressionism, you know, in, in the larger sense and really fits in and holds up. Um, you know, in the larger history of American art and art history. And so that's something that, you know, we get into a lot. We can talk to about maybe today or later on is this pull between regional versus American art, sort of, um, you know, what, it, you know, how do you fit into the larger scale? Like someone like Julian Onderdonk, who we'll talk about later, or David Bates. I mean, these are artists that they're sold in Texas because Texas collectors are so passionate about them um, and they're so identified as Texas and they tend to sell for more money in Texas art. But that doesn't mean they don't fit into the larger story of American art and they couldn't sell easily in one of our signature American auctions and probably do, you know, almost just as well. So that's a, a fascinating question. And I'd kind of like to get into that now, which is how do we define Texas art in as much as that there is Western art, there's Texas art. Some of the artists that we sell in Texas weren't necessarily born in Texas, probably mm -hmm. maybe passed through Texas for a little while. I was thinking specifically about Robert William Wood, who we'll discuss in a second, mm -hmm. who was English born mm -hmm. as opposed to Onderdonk, who, you know, uh, especially Julian Onderdonk, who mm -hmm. we'll get to here in a second as well. So I am sort of fascinated by how we classify and, and separate and, and sell these particular artists and these particular, I don't want to call them genres, but but certainly styles. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no hard and fast rule, but um, sort of generally, you know, Western art is tends to be more cowboys, Native Americans, wildlife art, the bronzes, the thing that you would really expect to find 
um, you know, in a, in a Western, heavily Western themed art collection. Texas art tends to be more non-Western themed Texas art. So um, very early impressionist landscapes and um, the traveling artists who came from Europe to paint, you know, scenes of settlers in Texas and that kind of thing. And then you have mid-century modernism and abstract art and contemporary art. And you will find some artists who pop up who, um, um, you know, we all like there's a Fred Darge who tends to sell very well in Texas art and does, he was a cowboy and he paints sort of really great modernist um, things. And so he was a bit of a cowboy artist and he is in Texas, but um, for the most part, if it is a heavily Western theme, it is in another um, in another auction. And and then some artists get divided up. Like G. Harvey is a really good example. Um, G. Harvey painted a lot of very like regular, pure Texas landscapes early in his career. Those tend to go in Texas art. And then his you know cowboys on the streets of San Francisco, mm -hmm. um, you know, like right out of a Western movie kind of a thing. Those go in Western or art of the West or something like that. So there's right. no hard and fast rule, but Texas is generally um, non-Western uh, Texas art. And then also um, if you look to like some of the, like a good example of a sort of just great, you know, regular definition comes from Cassetta, which I'll probably talk about again, which uh, I'll say the acronym this time because <laughs> it's long, but it's the Center for the Advancement and Study of Early Texas Art. And they define, they define Texas art as basically anything painted by someone from Texas or in Texas or about Texas. And they define early Texas art as sort of 50 years from now, which of course is a moving target and is <laughs> problematic. And we could get into that, you know, in a lot of different ways. But, um, but yeah, those are kind of the, the basics. Um, and again, it's one of those things where, you know, there's no one hard and fast rule. So what do collectors do collectors have a thing in mind when they talk about Texas art? Certainly, you know, some of our most crowded auctions before the pandemic, uh, as I was led to understand, were the Texas art auctions that oh. people actually came in, that the room was filled. And this is people who were, you know, since we're in Dallas, these are people who were incredibly passionate about art that was made in their backyard. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'll never forget the first auction I had at Heritage because, um, you know, as an auctioneer who was used to things that were mostly online to auctions where we'd have a few people in the room and there he is with 150 people drinking and having a great time and <laughs> trying to juggle all of that. And, and, you know, it's fun and it gives our auctions so much energy when people come in person. But, you know, Texas artists, um, I mean, Texas collectors are so passionate and it's a real community. Um, we all know each other for the most part, and we enjoy spending time together and we get together for um, events and conferences. I mean, that's why I say about heritage is sort of an easy sell in so many ways, especially for your higher end Texas art, because you get the best of both worlds. We're a regional auction house. We know all the collectors. We are very plugged into the community. Um, we, you know, we have them come up from Houston, come up from San Antonio, things are events. But then you also get the national, international reach of our website and our marketing capabilities. And you'll have people call me from New York and say, who's this guy, Julian Onderdonk, that's going crazy, um, you know, kind of a thing. And then I call up a Texas collector and I'm all, are you going to let them take this blue bonnet painting back to New York? <laughs> and, um, you know, that kind of thing. So um, anyway, sorry, I lost my train of thought a little bit. But <laughs> well, <laughs> so you, 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 you raise a really good point. And I'd like yeah. to get to the Onderdonks because certainly... Yeah. Um, you know, in my time here and my, my, my long 18 months at Heritage, certainly Underdog is the Underdog family, the definitive Texas artist for many people. Is that right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He is. And I mean, what We're you're talking seeing about Julian here, here now. Yeah. What you're seeing right now is Julian Underdog. This is the current world record holder. The most one of his paintings has ever sold for. Maybe the most of real Texas Texas painting that's not like a Rauschenberg or something like that, <laughs> um, you know, has sold for at auction. And, um, you know, he is the seminal father of Texas landscape painting. Uh, I think there's there's several different reasons for that. Um, first of all, um, you know, he was just an amazing painter. Um, he was so talented and he was so plugged into the natural world. And he was just from an early, early age, a naturalist who wanted to paint the landscape of Texas. In fact, it's kind of a joke. He wasn't the best figure painter. He really was a great, great landscape painter. But he, you know, it's really the Onderdonk family. That's a that's a really great uh, picture of him by William Merritt Chase. So 
Um, to really understand them, you have to understand that his father, Robert uh, Julian Onderdonk, which I know that's not confusing, um, he <laughs> was an artist himself, and he um, was not a native to Texas. He went and studied in New York with the greatest teachers of the time, studied with William Merritt Chase at the Art Student League. And then he um, married an artist and moved to San Antonio, and San Antonio was the artist colony in Texas. Um, and this was in the late 19th century. And um, he had several children who were all artistically inclined, including Julian. And um, Julian was trained from a young age and encouraged to you know, follow the arts and was a native son of Texas. And he eventually, in 1901, went to New York himself, Julian, and studied with William Merritt Chase at the Art Student League, studied at Shinnecock in his summer um, classes out in Long Island, and spent eight years out there just really developing his style. So if you wanted to throw up, um, um, if you want to throw up number four, the image number four, uh, just to kind of show, this is a picture that Julian painted of his sister, Eleanor, in their home in San Antonio. Um, it's not the greatest portrait in the world, um, but it's really great for Julian. And because the Onderdonks were a family of artists and they all painted and drew each other, um, there's a whole sub-collecting group of uh, Onderdonk portrait collectors. I was just so, about to ask you that because I'm fa I, I, yeah. I heard that. Yeah. That you, you just want to collect Onderdonks painting other underdogs. Yeah, yeah. And so if we want to go to image number five, this is a picture that um, Julian did of his sister, um, Adrian. And um, this was in a recent auction. And I think is a good example of how even, you know, drawings, and this actually came from um, Julian Underdonk's great, great niece. Um, it was consigned. Um, I've gotten to know some of the Underdonk family heirs, which has been fun over the years. Um, okay. You know, these things still sell for, you know, quite a respectable amount of money. And we have them come up from time to time. And, you know, collectors love them and love being part of the Underdonk family story. Well, do you think that, I mean, you know, it's sort of, if you collect, I assume if you collect Texas art, if you are a serious collector, you have to have an underdog. It sort of is the definitive work, right? I mean, that is. Yeah. No, I think so. And, but, but the point is, is that you don't have to have a six figure, you know, gigantic blue bonnet underdog. Um, you can have, um, you know, other examples of his work and, you know, ones that connect back also to, you know, his history and why he's so important. So if you were to go to number um, six, you'll see this is a piece that he um, painted when he was in New York. There's some really great New York pieces that you can pick up for, you know, 10 or $20,000 that are just beautiful. I mean, the sense of light, um, the colors, everything, you know, capturing the snow are just so beautiful. Um, and, you know, you can have an underdog, a really special one um, without, you know, getting into the huge um, bucks. And another great example we have is the number six, which is, um, I can't underestimate the importance of William Merritt Chase. Um, he was the greatest American art teacher of his generation. He taught Marsden Hartley, Georgia O'Keeffe, everyone. And it really was important. You know, Onderdonk was born in San Antonio, was born in Texas. He went to New York. He studied with the absolute best teachers in the world and came home and painted Texas passionately. Um, so this is an example of his work where you can really see the influence of William Merritt Chase. Um, you can see that figure in the background pulling your eye and the path. And, you know, this is just classic example of, of um, the influence that Chase had um, on Onderdonk, which was so amazing. And, you know, again, works that you can pick up for, um, you know, a pretty reasonable amount without completely breaking the bank. And we're always looking for these New York works. Do you find exactly. that you, know, we, you talk a lot about breaking, not, not breaking the bank, that these pieces are, are relatively affordable? We've seen some for 20000 30000 over the course of just the last few minutes. Mm -hmm. I've always kind of wondered if something is labeled as Texas art, um, does that, if as opposed to, say, American art or whatever we choose to, to describe it in, in auctions here, in categories here as well, does that, um, do folks who live in California or London or Hong Kong portray that value to be different because it is just Texas art. It is considered a regional work as opposed to an American work when in fact, underdogs, whether they're the blue bonnet works or the chase influence works 
certainly uh, could hold their own against anything we offer in American art. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think that that um, whenever you're dealing with a regional area of collecting, whether it be California or the south of France or Texas, you know, you're always going to come up against um, the sort of stigma of it being a regional work. And that's a lot of what we do, um, you know, really trying to educate people and um, really understand that these works can and will hold up against you know, the best in other places. We're going to look at, you know, David Bates later. And, um, you know, you he's now selling in New York and in Europe and everywhere. He could easily be in modern contemporary. It's just right. that his collectors are so passionate about him and they so get into it and they just go crazy bidding when we have him in, in Texas art. Um, and he gets to be sort of the top, top, top star of Texas art. Um, but, you know, that, again, is a great thing about heritage. And one thing that I think heritage really brings to the table with a c category like Texas is, um, again, yes, we are, it's part of the Texas sale that people come for and they're there in person and there's all this great energy, but also we're online. You can find us. We cross market our David Bates with modern and contemporary. We have ads, they see our ads. So, um, you know, just because it's in a Texas category, especially at heritage, doesn't mean that it's going to get, um, you know, pigeonholed as a regionalist painting, and it's going to get exposure across the board. So again, I real I know I'm just like plugging heritage, but it's great. It makes my job so easy as a category because we, you know, your your Texas art is the star of a show that is, um, you know, so popular and so beloved. But you're also getting all of the great you know heritage energy and marketing and everything behind it so it's a really easy sell i actually i have a really great job at heritage um you know i'm just kind of waiting here for you to make you know uh bring me your art and and let me sell it so Adley, we all have really great jobs here at heritage auctions the um so look you know i, I certainly understand when an underdog blue bonnet Blue bonnets are synonymous with Texas. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you, you don't grow up here without pulling over the side of the road and taking a thousand pictures with your parents when you're little, laying in a field of blue bonnets. Um, so it doesn't surprise me that underdog blue bonnets are iconic and do sell very well. Uh -huh. What is the the best price you have seen for a non blue bonnet? Julian? Okay, and this is actually I love blue bonnets myself, but this is my <laughs> favorite painting that I've ever sold by Underdonk. Um, and uh, I just love it. I think this is the still the record for a non blue bonnet Underdonk at auction, and um, it is amazing for so many reasons. I mean, the trees, the color, you can feel the heat, and boy, we can feel it right now, can't we? I mean, you can feel how hot it is. And the summer this painting time. looks like it feels outside. I know. And, you know, you have this articulation of the limestone and the um, cactus and everything. I mean, it's just so exquisite. The foreground, the middle ground, everything is it's absolutely, you know, one of my favorites I ever sold. And it was in the it kind of got overshadowed because it was in the same sale as that world record holder. Um, but, um, you know, there are people who don't like blue bonnets. I mean, a lot of, <laughs> I'll tell you a secret and I'm not down on people who like blue bonnets, but, and, and basically every painter has been trying to paint blue bonnets like Julian Onderdonk since Julian Onderdonk. But by the end of his life, Julian Onderdonk didn't like painting blue bonnets. <laughs> he was over it, but he was always broke and needed the money and people just went crazy for him. I mean, they're so beautiful. It's, it's really hard, you know, not to be completely enthralled by them um but uh yeah he definitely towards the end of his life was wanting to paint you know more of other things and and he just did such a great job that everyone's been trying to paint blue bonnets like that since so what is the market because i'm fascinated by the whole underdog market because certainly robert julian who's fascinated me uh even more than julian i'm not gonna lie because robert actually had a school in dallas i believe mm -hmm. at one point he actually founded one of dallas's very first art schools uh, mm -hmm. during his short time here having come from san antonio whereas you know there was the art colony but dallas is where he came after that and tried to do in dallas what had taken off in san antonio so for me robert julian is sort of the uh, the alpha of all of this kind of discussion. yeah and there's not a lot of his work out there comparatively i mean he took some commissions and there's some very important pieces like his battle of the alamo the alamo um uh piece that's in the capital is absolutely stunning and some other things but he you know he was always working teaching teaching his kids they were always broke 
Um, you know, he was very involved with the art fairs in New York and everything was all over the place. And he just didn't paint a ton of pieces. And um, we were really lucky. Uh, recently, we just sold, um, I can't remember, let's see, what number is it? It is number nine. This is the tiles that are the afternoon walk. And so, um, you know, he trained um, uh, um, in sort of the English style. And this is a piece painted on porcelain when he was in Chicago um working for a porcelain tile painter and it was really special because it was a it's a big tile work and it's really wonderfully done you can see that william Merritt chase um influence in it as well and um you know really nothing like this had ever come up for auction and it was a interesting you know uh prospect as well because you know it's not a traditional painting it's very heavy it has to be installed but it had been beautifully preserved and um, I was a little nervous, you know, because it's it's a delicate thing. Um, but we did have a lot of really good interest, and it ended up selling for about sixty five thousand dollars, which was a world record for him. Um, right, I, I remember seeing this piece. In fact, uh, I believe I wrote about it at the time because I was yeah. so enamored of it. I, yeah. I think that this is sort of one of those pieces that sort of spoke to me. And as much as that, it was since it was Roberts, and since it was uh, a tile, and since it sort of defined uh, sort of what he was doing with his life at that period, I was mm -hmm. fascinated by it. I'm working on a Robert Onderdonk for the upcoming auction too. That's a cute little genre scene. Um, there's actually one that we sold a lot like it called the Mexican um, Jacal we sold um, a few years ago. Um, and this isn't the piece that we have coming, but you can see this was a relatively small work. Um, uh, seven by nine inches and ended up selling for 30,000. I think that's just a, you know, your instincts are right on when you have an artist who is so well known and you know that there are not tons of pieces out there. Um, that is definitely, um, you know, something that drives the market. And actually that's a reason why, one of the reasons why I think Julian Onderdonk would have always been an artist, you know, with a great market and it would have maintained through ups and downs of, you know, uh, tastes and all that kind of thing. But Julian Onderdonk also tragically died at age 40. Um, he died at the peak of his career. He'd only been back in Texas for about 12 years at the time. And, um, you know, people were taking paintings off the easel wet. He was so popular. And then he just died. So there's no, um, you know, the body of his work is pretty big for someone who only lived his life. He was a very prolific painter. But it's limited. Um, you know, he never went downhill. There's no later periods or lesser works around. Um, you know, he only lived to be 40. And we know how pretty much how many paintings there are by him out there. Um, and with one exception, because I will tell you an interesting thing. I should have had a slide of one of these that came up a few years ago about Onderdonk was um, an artist, um, you know, a scholar named James Baker wrote a book about um, when he was in New York, always trying to make money, always broke. He actually took on a pseudonym, um, Chas, C-H-A-S period Turner. And he painted in New York under that name and sold so he could sell and have more galleries and make more money. And so there, um, uh, Mr. Baker wrote a book about, um, about this. And so um, there's been sort of in the last 10 years or so, or five years of craze for trying to find these Chas Turner paintings that are actually really underdogs. Um, so that's Were they a, whole... a different style. I mean, did they did they show? A, a, no, a I mean they're his New York work, so they tend to be a little darker and more tonalist. Um, you know, sort of. Uh, yeah, the, or uh, well, not this one <laughs> uh, uh, in particular, but you know, they, they're very solid. His New York works, either Shinnecock or um, you know when he was studying at the Art Student League. So they tend to be kind of that style from 1901 and 1909. Because I've always wondered about artists who die young if they were suggesting you know certainly musicians you can say well so and so was pointing toward a different style shortly before he died and mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. is what he she was hoping to sound like eventually or would have sounded like eventually i sort of wonder about that about underdog as well if in fact there was something coming that wasn't yet fully realized at the time of uh, at such an early death <clears throat> i mean i definitely think that for all um Julian Onderdonk's style has sort of, not by himself, but by other artists, sort of been frozen in time for all intents and purposes. Ever since Onderdonk, you have sort of one generation after the other of really great landscape painters. A lot of them do a lot of blue bonnets who sort of, you know, come up in, and, and, you know, you sort of have this Julian Onderdonk style, but I don't think that Julian Onderdonk would have just stayed in his lane. Like he, he right. was always developing and changing. And I have definitely seen some later works where he was getting a little looser, he was getting a little more abstract he was working in a little bit brighter colors. So I suspect that 
Onderdonk would have, I don't think he would have ever gone crazy into total modernism and he would have always been grounded in nature and in what he could see and what he could go out and paint. But I suspect that his style would have developed and changed and become a little bit more modern. Um, you know, I don't think he would have just stayed doing the same old thing for his entire life. So we've talked a lot about the underdogs. I do want to come back to somebody that I mentioned earlier, which is Robert William Wood. Because mm -hmm. William uh, Robert William Wood was, in fact, English. Um, mm -hmm. Actually traveled a big part of the United States uh, throughout his artistic career. Mm -hmm. But I, if I'm not mistaken, probably one of the most reproduced artists in America. Oh, my gosh. I mean, you see his paintings everywhere. There's tons of G-clays, uh, tons of reproductions. I see at least five Robert Wood's printed on board people think uh, you know is a is a real oil painting um, <laughs> you know a week um and was in catalogs and you know people just loved his work and it is everywhere i mean it's on the back in movies and you once you start finding them you never start losing them <laughs> this is a really good example of one of his blue bonnet paintings and um what, uh, you know kind of a rule of thumb because you know he painted all over the place. Um, he was mostly in Texas in the 30s and 40s, although he did come back, he did continue to paint it. But one kind of, you know, quick thing I can teach everyone about early Texas art, if they want to know, is that a lot of times, um, Robert Woods, um, the more valuable ones, at least are the more impressionistic ones, like the one we're looking at right now. And if you were to blow that up, you would see that the signature on it is R-O-B-T period Wood. So one of the things you can do to help identify early Robert Woods is in the in the 20s and 30s, he tended to sign R Wood or R O B T Wood. So um, if you wanted to go to the next image link that I showed you, there's a little bit later one um, where, and this is another, you know, very popular, it still, you know, did very well and it's really well painted, but you can tell that it's a little bit later work from the 1950s because he signed his signature. Robert Wood, or you know, written out. So, um, you know, you're always going to be able to sell Robert Woods. He's one of those artists that he shows in multiple categories. Um, you know, there, there's always people that are interested in him um, at different price points. We actually, I'm working on several of them for the auction that haven't come in yet. There is one that we have already, um, which is um, Autumn in the Mountains. This is obviously not a Texas scene, but a nice um, Colorado uh, Robert Wood that we're going to have in the Texas sale. It sort of came as part of a Texas consignment. Again, that's one of those things that could go in Art of the West or in a monthly, you know, but, um, you know, we're going to have it in Texas this time around. Because, and I assume, again, that's because Wood was here for so long and did, in fact, sort of help define uh, kind of that Texas image, that Texas style. You know, there's certainly blue bonnets in Robert Wood's work. Oh, yes. And I mean, again, this is something where, and this is a great, I know I'm plugging heritage again, but um, we that's have- That's what we're here to do, by the I way. I know, we have, we have this flexibility. So that's what's great is that we can get a Robert Wood in, especially when a little bit more high value or something and say, okay, we're really go to where the market is. Well, yeah, I mean, like, okay, maybe even David Bates is a better example. Like, yeah, David Bates is still amazing in a modern contemporary sale. He would. But is he maybe going to sell for a little bit more in Texas art where he's like the main attraction and on the cover and like everyone's super excited? Yeah. So would a Robert would like this do really well in a monthly or Art of the West with blue bonnets? Sure. But if we put it in a Texas sale with people hunting for blue bonnets, it's going to go crazy. So we have a flexibility to say, oh, maybe this G Harvey should go here or, you know, this or put it in this sale. And it's really about us trying to go where the market is the strongest. And you know, I tell people that a lot. It's like heritage. The great thing about consignment, the great thing about auction is we only make money when you make money. So all the advice I'm going to give you, the estimates, my strategies for selling, it's all in the service of all of us making more money. Our interests are 100% aligned. So when I say, oh, well, maybe this should go in Texas instead of American, it's because I think it's going to do a little bit better there. You know, I wanted to ask you about Porfirio Salinas. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken... President LBJ's uh, favorite artist. Uh, yes, Mercedes. Salinas. Yeah, he he was around for a while, but he really got famous after LBJ became president because yeah. uh, Salinas was his favorite artist. And Salinas did a lot of pure landscapes, a lot of blue bonnets, but this is one we just sold. Um, and uh, it's great because he, you know, I love this whole looking him over. I mean, it was a great title um to start with and you're you know out there on your ranch in the hill country you know looking over the cattle herd and i think that's it's pretty special and it's so iconic i mean a 
a doctor's office or a law firm in Texas is just not complete without cleanliness, <laughs> you know, on the wall. It's just, you know, you got to have one. I have been in several law offices in the course of 30 years where I think there has been at least one Salinas hanging in every uh, conference room. Exactly. I mean, they look great out at the ranch or, you know, in your home and, and people recognize them and they're very iconic. I have to say, I think it's some of my favorite because it's interesting, you know, when you grow up in Texas, as we did, as we have, as we still live in Texas, you know, to me, it's always fascinating because these images sort of cement the look the idea the the mentality of texas mm -hmm. to so many who don't live here right this mm -hmm. is what people think of when they think of texas mm -hmm. whether it's the blue bonnet scenes of underdog or whether it's salinas's wide open spaces salinas to me sort of was the john ford of, of texas painting these were these could have been out of any john ford western yeah in fact we have one coming up in the next auction it's the next image um which is um a bullfighter which I think is, uh, you know, sort of Texas adjacent. I mean, so they're, they are creating the myth of Texas. Um, these artists are definitely, and, and early on, like with some history paintings, like the McArdle we spoke about, um, you know, um, th those were actively creating the myth of Texas, you know, a lot of them intentionally, but also artists reveal the, you know, um, the subtleties of Texas culture and the things that aren't always, you know, at the, you know, on the John Ford page. So here's an example of Salinas doing one of his sort of epic bullfighter paintings, which um, was a, a genre that you'll find around, especially down in San Antonio and um, areas like that, that were very popular. And this is coming up in our next auction. These aren't terribly expensive. They're five to $7,000 estimates. Um, and, you know, and I have to tell you, Adley, that's, a, that stuns me yeah. because that's a pretty iconic piece. I've seen that painting uh, before. Uh, certainly Salinas' bullfighting pieces are, are incredibly popular. Um, the low estimate, I guess, on that really sort of surprises me. Well, I mean, I think that's where you get into, you kind of answered your own question in a way uh, without really realizing it, because one of the reasons why it's iconic is because Salinas painted it a lot. Right. So um, that is where you kind of get into a supply and demand situation. Um, you know, uh, Salinas like to paint bullfighters. They're around. They come up for auction regularly. They're not super rare. Right. Like looking them over, like an image of uh, figures in a landscape with cattle, that's a very rare Selena subject. So I can go to a consigner and say, you know, I mean, a buyer and say, I don't know when something like this is going to come up on the market again, um, you know, and price it accordingly. But with a bullfighter, when you have, you know, uh, six or seven bullfighters that come up a year for auction, you can't say that they're super rare and you kind of have sure. to price them accordingly. So, you know, that is definitely a very much a supply and demand, uh, you know, in many ways kind of answer. So I, I assume then that that's, it's that it's popular, right? That that these are pieces that oh, yeah. you when you bring them, you know that they will do well. They probably mm -hmm. will do overestimate. They will get a lot of eyeballs and attention because these are sort of. I assume you want to own as much as one would want to own a blue bonnet portrait by Underdog. You'd want to own a Salinas bullfighter because these are emblematic of, of what his work was about. Yeah, I mean, it's all about um, you know, uh, artists are iconic and they mean something to us, and um, it means something to be able to look over at something and say that's a Salinas or that's an on. I mean, I've sold Underdog blue bonnets that were seven by nine inches that you could hang in a gold frame, you know, thirty feet away, and you look at that and you know that's an Underdog blue bonnet because it's so beautiful, and that you know that's. That's another sort of fallacy a lot of, of collecting in general. And you, I'm sure, know that someone will say to, come to you and say, look, this is the only time this artist ever painted this, or um, this is such a rare example, or it's early, or, you know, this kind of thing. But, and and so, so that's when you get into, oh, it's so rare. So you don't right. have a lot of supply, right? But at the same time, people want a piece that looks like that artist. They don't want an early work that looks like something else. They want to be able to look at it and identify it for what it is. So, you know, that's a moment where just because it's rare or only a few of them exist, doesn't mean it's going to be valuable to collectors. So, so you kind of, it, to that end, it kind of reminds me of something that brings me back to something you said earlier when we're talking about mid-century modernism and regionalism, mm -hmm. that these are not pieces that are, when we talk about supply, that there is not an enormous supply. Mm -hmm. So when that stuff does come available, who does well and who who do people have an interest in and how easy or difficult is it to actually get folks to 
to bring that stuff to market, given the fact that there is a high demand and low supply for that stuff? I mean, it can be very difficult, um, especially, like I said, in these works, like, you know, where where family members want to hold on to them. They're right. not things, you know, generationally that go, they never they never go out of fashion. So right. um, they have, I assume they have family connections. They have ties to them because we oh, all absolutely. Grew up here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very personal or or people will buy things because of personal ties. Um, and of course, they'll never let them go. Like a lot of times, I love it when artists like note exactly where they are or what ranch they're on or like old <laughs> Blanco Road because someone will come to me and be like, well, that's my ranch. I have to buy that painting <laughs> for however much money it is. Right. You know, a, a kind of a thing. Um, so, um, you know, there's a there's a lot of factors that go into it. So when you can get your hands on these works, who is who who is doing particularly well in that uh, sort of mid-century modernism? Mid-century modernism, um, uh, you know, um, all of the Dallas Nine, uh, Lauren Mosley, um, Jerry Bywaters. Um, oh, gosh, of course, I'm blanking right now. There's so many in the Fort Worth School, Dixon Reader, uh, Brutter, Veronica Helfensteller. Uh, we're always looking for works um, also from the great like Houston abstract expressionists like Dorothy Hood um, and mid-century artists from down there. Um, you know, we're always looking around for and even by artists who aren't terribly well known. One of the pieces that I flagged to talk about um, later was number 20 um, by Octavio Medellin. Yeah. And he never really had anything at auction before. And um, this piece came out, um, it was, um, uh, it came out of a corporate collection. It had been bought for Neiman Marcus by Stanley Marcus. Um, it was an incredible example of his work. There really were no comparables. Uh, nothing by him had really come up for it. It was a relatively um, obscure, but known amongst collector circles and in Dallas. Um, and this is an example of how scholarship is so important to the marketplace and how it can drive the market as well, because um, as the sculpture was coming up for auction with us, um, it became known that the Dallas Museum of Art, which has a fabulous new curator of Latin American art, um, is putting a show together of Octavio Medellin and that the museum definitely wanted to have this piece in the show. And um, and please, whoever bought it, please, would they loan it to the show? <laughs> the museum could it have it, you know. And so word of this, you know, gets out. And so it's, uh, you know, maybe not the most famous artist, but it's maybe the best example of his work that exists. And it's, you know, about to be in scholarship, and he's about to get much better known, and you know, he's about to have a really important retrospective of the DMA. And so that's when you have people come in and. Man, that auction, that that uh, that piece started. I think it was at ten to fifteen thousand. The bidding started at five, and there were maybe fifteen bidders on it. And man, that was like the civil war. It was brother against brother. People who had been friends collecting for years, who would have maybe said in other circumstances, "Well, my my guy really wants that," you know. <laughs> no, 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 no. They wanted this piece, and it was a real fight. And you know, it, it was just amazing. And so what we're really looking for are the best examples of the work, you know, by all of these artists. Um, well, you know, it's fun. I work with uh, the uh, on the ticket, the radio station, the sports talk radio station here in Dallas. Uh, Ryan Medellin is a, a colleague of mine. I have a show on the ticket uh, wow. on Wednesdays. And uh, he spent 15 minutes on Saturday talking about uh, his grandfather, Octavio Medellin, and the and the uh, exhibition that's going to be at the DMA. So it was oh, very exciting. I mean, I love that. There's so many connections and things. Like I remember when I was selling the Battle of San Jacinto uh, painting and I kept thinking about my ancestor that had been at the Battle of San Jacinto and, um, you know, all the other connections. And there were so many stories and people coming and, you know, people in Texas, they are passionate about Texas. And that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And um, they are willing to invest in its history and culture. And they love those personal connections. So, um, you know, to see that Medellin sculpture, given the fact that that had been something that had been bought by Stanley Marcus, obviously the namesake co-founder of Neiman Marcus, uh, which began here in Dallas, obviously, um, Stanley Marcus having grown up on South Boulevard, uh, <laughs> I take great pride in knowing all of this stuff. So um, is it the provenance of the piece that helps make that Medellin such a in-demand piece during that particular auction? Is it the rarity of Medellin pieces that come to, to, because certainly 
as the the Stanley Marcus, uh, some of that collection uh, has made it to our, our auction here and elsewhere. Certainly, I assume that makes it sort of extra special to people who want a piece of that history as well. I mean, yes, there's always that added bit of history. And then also, I think, especially when it's something that Stanley purchased himself, is that Stanley just had the most exquisite taste. So in some ways, I think it's not even just about that it was Stanley, but that it was someone who is so renowned for their eye and ability to, you know, choose the best objects. And then it really was a perfect, um, you know, storm of, it just really is one of the best pieces he ever did. And it was a piece that was known and was documented. Like we were able to confer with the scholar who's working on the show and find out that the fill that had been used in parts of the wood was part of the original sculpture. It had never been touched or, um, you know, had any conservation work done on it or anything like that. It was still in sort of perfect condition. Um, but no, I mean, I think that that one was just kind of, you know, you can't ask for something better than to have, you know, the best example of an artist's work up for auction with that kind of history. Is sculpture something that that we that you handle often these days in Texas? Um, Army? not as much as I would like. I mean, a lot of sculpture is easier to live with than others. I don't have a picture. We do have a Jose Marola sculpture coming up um, in the auction. It's not photographed yet, but um, most of the collectors will know. Uh, we sold a lot of his work in the past. Um, he um, is a great uh, contemporary granite sculptor. Um, we'll also, we hold the worker, world record for James Thurl sculpture as a contemporary artist. And, um, you know, sculpture can be hard to live with. Like, actually, I love some of the artists like James Thurl's we've sold in the past. You know, some of these pieces that you see right here, like the disc, for example, hangs from the wall. Um, so um, I love doing the aerials and that kind of thing, because that allows you to have a three dimensional piece in your space without having taking up a huge amount of space. Um, but I'm a big advocate for three dimensional um, art. In fact, I think we're probably going to wrap up here a little bit talking about David Bates. And he's an artist who's known for his um, three dimensional and his two dimensional works. And we actually have a, um, we might as well go ahead and throw it up since of course I've talked our way through a lot of the time. Well, we cannot but, not talk about David Bates. I know, but I was going to bring up that this piece 28 that we have coming up, um, the self portrait is it's hard to see in the photos, but it's actually a three dimensional portrait. Um, so the pieces along the nose and a lot of the areas, it's very hard to tell in this photo, but that's actually three-dimensional built out wood piece, which is great. And this is the kind of sculpture I love too, where it's sculpture, but you hang it on your wall. So it's not in the way your kids aren't going to trip over it. No one's going to poke out an eye, you know, or, or anything like that. Uh, but you get that three-dimensionality, um, you know, and you get to, um, uh, you know, really experience that. Because if you just, if you just stick with two-dimensional art, you're really kind of missing out on something. Well, I, look, so David Bates, born and raised here, certainly the very definition of a Texas artist who actually got a great deal of acclaim very early on outside of Texas. And I always kind of wonder, you know, this is something that I experienced from years of writing about Dallas musicians, mm -hmm. that you had to go to New York, you had to go to Los Angeles, you had to leave home to be acclaimed in your home. No, no, you know, it's the, yeah. you're not a hero in your hometown until you're beloved elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Was that Bates's case? Um, I mean, I definitely think that, uh, yes, I mean, part that he went to New York and was so successful there and was so successful in the larger context of American art is definitely important. And it, and it helped. I think what it really did was help make Texas collectors feel comfortable spending the really big, money, <laughs> you know, because there's not a lot of contemporary art, um, you know, in Texas, especially by living working artists. And what I mean by contemporary right now is like living working artists that are still selling retail right. that sell for that much money at auction. It's usually, you know, a little bit later down the line when when they start blowing up. So I think that having success outside of Texas definitely helps people feel more um, comfortable writing that big check. Um, you know, kind of a thing. And it is one of those unfortunate things. And, you know, there's some artists that, you know, have gotten famous in their, you know, hometown or whatever, but you're right. It's like, I lived in New Orleans for a long time. And there is a, where as a musician, where you just, um, you know, until you make it somewhere else, you haven't really, you know, made it at home. Right. Uh, but, you know, again, David Bates has really managed to straddle that and uh, a lot like Heritage has, which, he is this great international national artist, but man, he has kept his roots in Texas and he's kept his collector base here and he stayed very grounded. I think that's helped him as an artist too. You know, he really stuck to his guns. He came up during a time where 
he was constantly being pressured to be more abstract um, and to do less figural work. And so you see this, this was a previous world record holder before we broke it uh, one last year in the middle of the pandemic, by the way. Um, but you can see, um, you know, these are, he's doing these figural works and he's putting, you know, whole figures in them or whatever. And he's doing these works that are based on sea creatures like this, um, right in the middle of the pandemic on September 26, 2020, we broke the world record for David Bates uh, again. Um, and sold this piece for $275,000. So, you know, Bates is an artist who really stuck to his guns and, um, you know, did what he, you know, wanted to do. I think his floral still lifes are a really good example. I think I put one of those on the list as well, uh, Purple Iris, um, you know, which, um, or, or this is one we just sold in the auction, the Waterfall, uh, which right. is very Mars and Hartley. And this was a big fight. This sold for about five times over its estimate. Um, one thing that's great about this, and this is another sort of market perspective, is this painting is big, but it's not huge. This was in another painting with a really big David Bates, which of course size matters in price. The bigger something is, the more expensive it is um, in a lot of ways. But you definitely reach a point where it's so big that the number of people who have space for it shrinks. So, um, you know, you sometimes have pieces that are a little bit smaller that will do even better because it's only 41 by 26 inches. And right. that is a, a reasonable size for your, um, for your home. But there's another one on the list, um, which is the purple irises. It's number 23. And, you know, the, the still life is a subject that is, kind of somewhat out of fashion. It can be a little ho-hum, um, <laughs> especially just flowers, you know, nothing, you know, super symbolic or whatever. But David Bates, I mean, he just was fearless and went in and put his own spin on things and does these still lifes that are just stunning. I mean, they're so graphic and gorgeous, the colors and um, the, the handling of the paint and everything. So I just commend him for sticking to his guns and pursuing his vision and um, you know, uh, doing what what he wanted to do, and and doing it better than anyone else. I assume there will be uh, David Bates in the October auction, correct? Yeah, the uh, the very special portrait that we showed a minute ago will be in there, and um, uh, we also already have another work called Pensacola, which is part of his truck series. Which there's several of them that have been up for auction, so they're not super rare. So they're selling reasonably thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars, forty, forty-five thousand um, dollars. But they're super fun, and they have so much personality, and we're super excited to have it in the sale in October. But I think that portrait is also very, uh, very, very special um, that we have coming up. Uh, let's be honest, a truck uh, painting in 2021 is uh, as as iconic as a blue bonnet painting. <laughs> I think it is too. Exactly. And that's what we're all looking for. These, you know, iconic uh, pieces that we really connect to personally. I mean, there's a lot of people who write about, you know, what are the next generation of collectors looking for? Um, you know, I'm trying to anticipate where the styles are going to be and all that kind of thing. But a lot of people my age, we really want to feel, uh, and, you know, in all ages, we want to feel personal connections to things. Um, so we want an op, you know, uh, something that is beautiful. And I, I personally love an object that just as itself is, you know, really stunning. But we also, um, I think especially something we want to look at every day, we want to look at it and feel something and remember something and we want to live with that. And so that's when art is at its best, when it's, you know, enriching our lives that way. So I assume that's in part why we think that uh, Texas art is one of the categories that thrived in even in the midst of a tumultuous 2020 is that there was some connection with or some hope to reconnect with something that we have a, a personal affection for or affiliation to, right? That's why we Absolutely. we discussed nostalgia being a big fueling factor in the last year in terms of success is that people wanted to sort of climb back into that which made them comfortable. If you're in Texas, these particular pieces sort of bring you back home without ever having to walk out your door. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, no. And I mean, I think a lot of it is just like people wanting to curate their the personal experience of their space. They want to feel good about their space and they want to surround themselves with objects that make them feel better, you know, and, and dark times and that evoke things for them. So um, people are I think that's why there's you know, so much with interior design and design. I mean, it's not for me, it's not, you know, just that you're there and you want something new and you're bored with it. It's that we're actually curating 
spaces that help improve our moods and that make us happy. And, um, you know, if you can find a painting that invokes something in you or a sculpture um, that enriches your life that way, then, um, you know, why shouldn't you pursue it? And Texans are passionate. They're passionate about Texas and um, they're passionate about their art. Look, so we've been talking for 55 minutes, and I have to tell you, it feels like five. This is <laughs> this is a delight, Adley. I, I'm I'm thrilled to learn a, a great deal about something about which I know very little, but want to know a great deal more. Yeah. If anybody has a question before we wrap it up, feel free to uh, ask a question. Harold Conover asks, uh, Fred Darge has a great story about living his dream, making him intriguing of what Texas art is all about. I love Fred Darge. One of my things that I love about him is that there are a lot, and I'm not looking down on them, you know, but there are a lot of artists who paint Western subjects who, um, you know, are enthralled with the West and know a lot about it. But Fred was Fred Darge was an actual cowhand, and he worked in uh, ranches all over the West. And you know, when you look at his saddles or his um, cook wagon, you know, chuck wagon paintings or whatever, like there is a lot of real historical accuracy, you know, there. He really was painting Texas the way he saw it. And he saw it, you know, as a cowboy. Um, and I, I really like his work. It's a great balance of modernism and, you know, te Texas traditionalism. Thank you, Libby. Uh, Libby tells you, you've done a great job here, Adley. You've learned so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, and I'm available. I, I love to talk. And if you have an artist that you have a question about or, um, you know, you are wanting to learn more, something in your collection or doing research, you can always give me a call or shoot me an email. And, you know, I'm happy to you know help you explore that. If it's also the perfect time to consign for the sale, it it's coming up on October 23rd. Perfect time to consign. And I think it's going to be a really fun auction. You know, our Texas auctions have been getting kind of smaller by quantity, but, but larger by quant uh, quality right. over the last few years. So I'm really proud that pretty much every painting that we've brought to auctions for Texas art, you know, in the last few years has been a really great painting, you know, that deserves to find a good home. And, um, and we have buyers. So, um, you know, it's a great time to sell. I don't know if there are people out there thinking, I don't know if it's a great time to sell. It's a great time to sell. People are buying, buying, buying. Before we wrap up, and I'm going to let you go here in just a minute, but I did want to ask you one quick question, which is, is there a holy grail artist for you, a white whale, somebody who you've been trying to get a piece into an auction, but simply, but simply mm. has not been available for whatever reason? For a long time, it was Jose Arpa. I really wanted to have a great Jose Arpa. He was an early, uh, he's a Spanish, Mexican, Texas artist in the 20s and 30s painted just a beautiful painter handling paint. And I've actually been very lucky to have some of his works in the last few years. Um, I think that probably the holiest of holy grails um, would be a Theodore Gentil. Um, and uh, I don't even think we have any examples of his work. He is probably the earliest Texas artist. He was a German artist who came over in the mid, uh, early and mid 19th century and painted Texas with the earliest waves of settlers. And those are the ones that are known. They're all, they're all certain places, but, um, but really, I mean, I just want to see the best example by whatever artist it is. So that's what I'm always waiting for. Oh, and I'll throw in one more. Um, one of my favorite Texas paintings, and I've never sold one of her paintings at Heritage. I don't think we've ever sold one. They're so rare, is, uh, rare, is Ruth Pershing Euler, U-H-L-E-R, who is an amazing modernist um, and is in some of the most important Texas collections. But her work is so rare. We almost never come across it. So if anyone is sitting out there on a Ruth Pershing Euler, please give me a call immediately. <laughs> but you said we do have a... Um... That one in the far right up there. Uh, the, oh, sorry. We're, um, but yeah, that's a great example of her work where you've got, you know, she's got a sort of Georgia O'Keeffe thing going on. Yeah, that's stunning. You know, really great. So I'm always, I'm always looking for her stuff. But you did say that in October, it sounds like we have a Jerry Bywaters. Yeah, we have a little Jerry Bywaters um, thing. We have a Jose Morales sculpture. We have um, a, an Onderdonk, which I actually just realized that I didn't show you the Onderdonk that was coming up in the auction, which is definitely um, my bad. Um, it's number 10. So let's get that up there before we go. I actually had someone drop off some other Onderdonks today that we didn't make it in. But this image... Um, Sorry. Oh, sorry. Not number 10. Um, it is um, number 12. Um, this is in the Mesquite Brush, Southwest Texas, 1915. So this is a really beautiful and and 
underdog painted a lot in the hill country, not as much in South Texas. So this is a little bit rare. Um, we have a really reasonable estimate on it of, um, I think, 30 to 50,000. And um, it is just a like, you know, the one we we're looking at earlier, his articulation of branches and cacti and, you know, the the land, the actual physical land of Texas is just unprecedented. So we're really excited to have this in the October auction. Well, Adley, this has been a true delight. I'm really, really glad we got a chance to do this. And uh, if you have questions for Adley, you have her email address, atleyp at ha.com. Uh, that's also the best way to uh, inquire about consignments or things that are in the upcoming auction. We'll do this again shortly um, because uh, I have many questions for you that we didn't <laughs> get to get to here. And uh, next time around, I'm sure folks will have questions as well. But the fact is, this was so educational and entertaining okay. that uh, I, I could not have asked for a, a better teacher. So thank you, Athlete. Well, it was my pleasure. And you went made it very easy for me. So thank you. Well, thank you. And thanks to everybody who watched. Uh, we'll do, uh, in fact, I think I have one tomorrow about uh, La Ligue. And, uh, Ooh, so that'll be good. Uh, talk about a, talk about a bunch of dumb guy questions for you tomorrow. <laughs> well. Thanks, Adley. Thanks, everybody, Bye. for watching. Thank you.